Hello and welcome to the vlog. It is a beautiful sunny day, blue skies out there, the temperature around 6 degrees Celsius, so not freezing but not exactly warm, and that's why I am sitting here by the fire for what is, I think, the first of my winter fireside chats for this year. I've had an email from a viewer and it's a very interesting email because it coincides precisely with some stuff I've been thinking about, so it was extremely well timed. And it's quite long, so forgive me, I've had to put it onto the old iPad so I can refer to it, but it's a series of questions about, with a bit of hindsight, having been on the boat for three years, what do I think of this and that aspect of my boat and would I want to change anything if I went back and did it again or if I got another boat? And this is very, very timely because, here's the shocker, I have indeed been idly putting my mind to thinking of changing the boat. Now, don't get me wrong, I love this boat. I've been on it for three years. If I didn't love it, I wouldn't have been on it that long. But, yes, there are some things that I would like changed and changing them on this one would mean a m massive job of taking stuff out. There are some things that just can't easily be changed on this boat. So I have been toying with whether to sell this and buy a different boat with various different aspects. And this email that goes through all sorts of different points is pretty much touching on everything that I've thought of. So I thought in this video for a fireside chat what I'd do is go through these points and explain what I'm thinking of. So for example, point one is boat length. My boat is 56 feet long and the question posed is you bought the boat because it felt right but do you feel that in fact it is the right length for a boat? Would you have liked a longer boat? Would you have liked a shorter boat? Is there an optimum length? And in fact, that is a question I get asked a lot. What is the right length for a boat that can go anywhere on the network? The standard answer to that is 57 feet. If you have a 57 foot or less boat, it can go to, I think, 99% of places on the canal network, presuming it's a narrow beam. Obviously, if you're wide beam, then you're constrained by the whole north-south can do the wide beam and you can't go through the middle. But purely talking narrow boats, 57 feet or less, you can do nearly everywhere. There are one or two, I think, fairly obscure locks that are quite a bit shorter. I was reading the other, about, the other day about one that's, I think, 40 feet long, but it's not one that's somewhere in the middle of the network that everyone gets stuck on. 57 or less, you can do pretty much everything. And in fact, even if you have a boat that's 58, 59 feet long, some of the slightly shorter locks are double width locks, so you can still get into them, but you have to go in and then turn yourself at an angle. So you wouldn't get two boats in alongside each other in that lock, just the one, but it goes in across the diagonal and you can still get into those slightly shorter locks. So 58 feet, 59 feet, still not too bad, but basically 57 or less and you can do most of the network. Am I happy with the length of my boat? Yes, it's perfect for a one-person liverboard. I wouldn't want anything shorter than 50 feet. It would be too cramped. I don't really want anything longer than 57 feet. Although, having said that, I suspect if, while looking, if I found the right boat that was 58, 59, 60, I might still be tempted to buy it. But I don't really want to go any bigger than that. Question two, and this is very much at the crux of what I've been thinking about lately, the layout on the stern. Based, the questioner says, on my practical experience, would I recommend a trad stern, such as I have, as being the best for a single full-time liverboard person? And the answer is no, I would not. When I was looking for my boat, all the advice I got was, if you're going to liverboard on your own, get a trad stern, because it's the most cabin space for your money. Now, the trad stern is where the whole engine room is enclosed as part of the cabin. It's not usable cabin space, it's just the engine with, the, with the, the sides and roof round it. You can't really use that space very much. Mine is full of oil cans and tools and mooring gear and oily rags and miscellaneous stuff. It's not useful living space. So a cruiser stern or a semi-trad stern, yes, you lose that enclosure over the engine, but 
normally, for example, on a semi-trad, you've got lockers in the back, so all the oil cans and stuff can still go in there. I'm not... I really don't think I'd be losing anything if I had a stern that wasn't a trad stern. And the disadvantage of a trad stern is that there's very little space at the back. Now, I'm not a very sociable person, but on the rare occasions when people come to visit, they can barely be at the back with me. You can have one person at the back with you and you have to stand with them right up close and personal in that little hatch area. You're not really supposed to stand on the back deck because if the rudder caught something in the water, the tiller could swipe sideways and knock you overboard. You're supposed to stand forward of it. That means you're standing in the hatch and you are standing with one other person at maximum. If there's anyone else coming aboard, they'll have to go up the far end at the well deck. It's just not sociable. And on those rare occasions, I'd like to have the people I've invited aboard to be with me at the back of the boat. So a cruiser stern or a semi-trad would be much, much more sociable. And on the summer evenings, when I'm moored up even on my own, I'd like to be able to sit out on the back deck in my deck chair on a cruiser stern, perhaps, or on the seats in a semi-trad stern and just enjoy the canal. Yes, I know I can sit in the well deck at the moment, but for some reason, because mine is a well deck with a cratch cover over it, it just feels a little bit... I don't know, it, it's not quite as open as I'd like. And yes, I can open the sides and I could take the whole cratch cover and cratch board off, but I have it there because it's useful for other reasons. The point is, the, the semi-trad or cruiser stern, I think I would certainly like to try a boat with that for a while. I'm not, as it turns out, a big fan of the trad stern. The advantage, as people often point out, is, well, because the engine is enclosed, you can work on it when it's raining. But if you have a semi-trad or a cruiser, you can always put up one of those big canvas pram hoods on the back. They are not pretty. I don't like them at all, but they're immensely useful. You can put them up while you're working on the engine. If you're moored up over winter, it becomes a complete extra cabin where you can hang coats to dry and leave your muddy welly boots and things. So the loss of the engine being enclosed that you get on a trad, I don't think is any great loss if you have a semi-trad or a cruiser stern. So I have idly started looking at the classified ads and the brokerages for other boats, just seeing what prices are around there and what things cost. And I'm definitely tending towards looking at a semi-trad stern. So that that would be my advice. If you ever want anyone to join you on the boat, the trad is, is not the one for you. Point number three in this email. Oh, by the way, I should have said at the start, there are quite a few points here, and this is going to be way more than just a one cup of tea vlog. You may well have settled down perhaps with cup of tea and a biscuit. This is going to be entire pot of tea with a tea cosy over it and a whole pack of Jaffa Cakes video. So, did I say cakes? I meant cakes. Jaffa cakes, anyway. Or custard creams. You get the gist. Point number three, saloon layout. Um, to enable the maximum alternative layouts to be used, would you have preferred an open plan saloon to which your loose chair and a fold-up table could be added rather than a fitted dinette and sofa? This is slightly confusing me because it seems to be confusing the saloon area with the dinette area. Where I am sitting now is the saloon area and mine is an open plan. Just there's nothing fitted in here. It's an open area. I've added the captain's chairs and a box of bits and then there's a load of other miscellaneous paraphernalia around here. The dinette is a fixed dinette, the L-shaped dinette to which I added my um, revised cushions and that is fitted in and has storage under. So they're two separate areas. The saloon, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it being an open plan saloon. I quite like these captain's chairs. They're nice to relax in of an evening. Um, in some ways, I would like a sofa in the saloon, but I looked for one before I bought the captain's chairs. I spent hours looking at all the standard narrowboat sofa solutions from companies like Nabru and oh, I forget the names of all the others, but honestly, trust me, I looked at them all and I could not find a sofa I liked. 
they were either uncomfortable, I sat on some of them at the Crick Boat Show and they weren't very comfortable, they had horrible fabrics and some of them were sofa beds which you needed to run widthwise across the boat but I, I don't have the width for it because I've got a radiator here and just various reasons could not find a sofa that would work for me in this layout which is why I went for the captain's chairs and that's kind of fine although the advantage of a sofa is you can get ones you can store things under so I'd be able to put things away a bit more tidily than I have now. As regarding my dinette the L-shaped dinette where it is in my boat I don't like I would much rather have the Pullman dinette which is the two bench seats opposite each other like an American style diner arrangement rather than the L-shaped dinette but if my dinette were immediately behind the saloon and the galley is where the dinette is then the L-shaped dinette would work better because it would become an extension of the saloon so it slightly depends on how the boat is configured as to whether an L-shaped dinette or a Pullman dinette would be best so I hope that answers that question. Point four the side door and the hatch. How often do I use my side door as an entry or exit point to the boat? Would I have preferred an opening side window only? And also to enjoy the view when the boat is moored up the other way round, would I have liked a second side hatch on the other side? Well, uh, I never use it as an entrance point to the boat. I, it, there are little steps on the side of the side hatch you can pull out and you can go in and out that way. I've never ever felt the need to do that. And I do open it up to see the ducks and swans coming by. But annoyingly, my side hatch is, is opposite the dinette, which is fine. But the dinette is not raised and the side hatch is obviously above the level of the gunwale. So when you're sitting at the dinette, your eye line is actually looking upwards and you're staring out at the sky. You can't really see the water. A lot of boats have the dinette area raised so that your eye line is more in, in line with the side hatch and you can better see out. And some, of course, have the side hatch on the same side as the dinette itself, so you are literally looking out as you sit there, there's the water beside you, and that would be a much better arrangement. So, yes, I would have liked another side hatch. B, I'd have liked the dinette to be raised up to the level of the side hatches, and C, no, I never use it as an entry point to the boat, so the little extra bit on the roof that also flips open, for me, is a waste of time and if it wasn't there I could have got another solar panel easily on the roof but I don't want to put one there because if anyone ever opens that top bit of the side hatch it'll crash into another solar panel. The bathroom. Non walkthrough bathrooms and walkthrough bathrooms which would you prefer? Well walkthrough is where in order to get from the front of the boat to the back you literally have to walk through the bathroom there is no choice and mine is not that mine is an off corridor bathroom where you can walk up the back uh, of the boat and someone can be in the bathroom with the door shut. Weirdly even though I'm on my own on the boat I prefer the off corridor bathroom that can be shut and enclosed. I've, I've never warmed to walk through bathrooms. There's a lot of them where as you're looking from the saloon or from the bedroom into the bathroom you can see the toilet. I don't want to be looking at the loo even with the lid shut. I, I, I don't know I'm not squeamish about the loo goodness only knows I've got a cassette toilet I empty it every few days. I'm not squeamish but I don't want to look at it. Now a lot of them OK, fair enough, they don't have the loo visible, but you're always going to be looking at the basin or the shower or something. And yes, you can shut the doors, but then that stops the warmth distributing throughout the boat. So I've never warmed to walk through bathrooms, even though they do give you the full width of the boat and therefore a, a bigger bathroom space. I prefer an off corridor. Now, there are some hybrid ones where the bathroom is sort of off corridor, but you open the doors out sideways into the corridor and then you gain the corridor space as part of the bathroom and that perhaps is the better arrangement if you can find it. The galley. Here is mine behind me. Line of cupboards on that side, line of cupboards on that side. You walk up through the middle of them. Would I have preferred an L-shaped or U-shaped galley? Yes, I would. I, I mean, I don't do much cooking as I've said many times on videos before but I'm not a fan of this 
two lines arrangement, an N-shaped one, to my mind, just brings everything much more close. I can stand in the middle and I'm not constantly turning round. In this one, I can be at the gas hob and then have to turn round for the fridge, turn back to the gas hob, turn back again to the sink. In an N-shaped or U-shaped, depending which way you look at it, galley, everything's much more to hand. And typically with those N-shaped galleys, your cooker and um, grill tends to be on your left at easily accessible height. Instead of it being down on the floor, we have to bend down and reach into the thing. They tend to put the cookers up at this height, so they are next to you as you're standing, and that's a much more sensible arrangement. Granted, the N-shaped galleys seem to be a bit smaller, but as I don't do a lot of cooking, that's not really a big issue to me. And you often find that although the main area is that N shape, on the f opposite wall they have a little sticky out bit of extra workspace as well, which doesn't obscure the path through the galley, but um, gives you that little bit of storage, little bit of workspace. So yes, I would definitely prefer uh, an N shaped galley but i haven't tried one yet you see it might be that i get a boat with all these things i'm thinking oh, i wish i had this wish i had that and i'll suddenly think do you know what my old arrangement was much better but that is part of the reason why i'm toying with having another boat because it'll give me the chance to try some of these other arrangements out point number seven solar power has my solar been a valuable and useful investment and did i put enough solar on as a reminder I have 480 watts of solar power over two panels, 240 watts each, and yes, it has been fantastic. Even on a winter's day like today, I would be pulling in, if I wasn't connected to a shoreline, a reasonable amount of solar. I did do a video about this a long time ago saying, solar in winter is hopeless, it never brings anything in. Well, I stand by that, it is true, but that's for typical winter days. Today is not typical, it's absolutely glorious outside and yes the solar panels would be pulling in some power, albeit that of course the day is still relatively short so you don't get so many hours of solar power. But from spring, summer, late summer my panels pull in way more power than I need. I could easily have a bigger battery bank or certainly some newer batteries that could soak up that power. There's surplus, I can happily be running things in the boat and effectively the solar is running them. Okay, the solar goes into the battery, the battery goes into the things I'm running, but I'm running throughout the day on solar and then overnight the batteries are probably just running the fridge really. 480 watts, I wouldn't have wanted any less. If you have any power hungry devices, I have a laptop for example for all my um, video editing, that's quite power hungry in boat terms. So yes, you need a fair amount of solar. I wouldn't have wanted less. I'd happily take another panel if I had some bigger batteries to soak it all up. But say 400, 500 watts, absolutely plenty from mid-March, let's say, to October, and even occasionally the odd winter day, uh, it would pull in enough power as well. By and large, you're probably still going to need a generator or shoreline or something else on uh, winter days. And wind turbines, if you have a question about wind turbines, please see my Frequently Asked Questions page on the website, which, as always, I commend to you anyway. Water cap position. My water cap for filling the water tank is on the floor of the well deck. And my questioner says, would it have made things a lot less messy if the water cap was installed on the foredeck next to the gas locker? Yeah, probably it would have done. Some boats have the filler cap on the gunnels and some have the filler cap on both sides of the gunnels so that no matter which way you end up mooring next to the bank, there's always a filler cap near to you for filling up the water tank. It's just how the boat builder built it. It's no great problem having the filler cap for me in the floor of the well deck, but yeah, as a, as a mere nicety, perhaps having the cap on the gunnels, one on either side, it'd be nice, but it's absolutely no deal breaker, no, no big problem at all. As for the kitchen galley floor, um, is there any benefit, is the question, of having storage in the floor of the galley? And 
yes, some boats, typically more modern and more upmarket boats, do have a wine cooler arrangement where you lift up a panel in the floor of the boat and under there, down where all the ballast is, under the waterline, of course, it's very cool and you can store, well, you can kind of use it as a fridge if you want to, but also a lot of people store wine under there. I would like that kind of arrangement. I don't, I don't drink wine, but having that under floor area in the kitchen to keep things cool would certainly be quite handy. Again, not a deal breaker, but it, it's one of those little nice things that if you were fitting out a boat yourself or in the luxurious position of having one made for you, it would be nice to specify a little storage area under the galley floor. Turning to the back of the boat, the question is, what about an extra wide hatch? If you're having a trad stern, would it be better to have a wider hatch area so that you're not quite so cramped with the visitors when they're standing alongside you? Um, I don't know. The hatch I've got is its not the smoothest opening hatch. You do have to give it quite a shove to move on its runners and a bigger one would be even heavier and, and more awkward, I think. I mean, you, you wouldn't really gain that much more space by having a, a bigger hatch. You might, I suppose, have less chance of cracking your head on it if it's wider and perhaps longer. I, I wouldn't say there's any huge benefit, as far as I know, to having a wide hatch on the back of a trad stern. I'd rather just swap stern and have a different stern arrangement, frankly. Point 11 uh, suggests, would it be a benefit sacrificing some below deck space by adding a utility or workshop area to the engine room to allow for better access to the engine whilst remaining protected from the elements. Um, yeah, I, I can see the advantage of that. Obviously, you then start to cut into your living space, but certainly more room for accessing the engine is handy. I don't think adding a couple of feet onto my engine bay would particularly give you better access because you've still got all the boards and you'd have to rip them up somehow and there's the metalwork supporting them i think it would still be fiddly as all heck what i would like in a utility room at the back of the boat let's say i've got my trad my, my semi-trad stern that i'd like to find so you've got the center hatch and normally on a semi-trad oh reverse layout is what i'm looking for as well which means the bedrooms at the front and the galleys at the back so you'd come down from your stern into the galley well because i want an n-shaped galley that means you kind of be coming down through the hatch straight onto the worktop so you need to come in and go to the side well if you start with a little utility area where perhaps i could put the washing machine and a space for coats and tools and things then there could be steps that come down and immediately sideways and then that would lead to the back of the galley area i hope this is making sense i may have to draw one of my famous sketches to illustrate what i'm talking about but yes, I would like a utility area. I'm not sure it would make a lot of difference in the trad engine room, but all the space is helpful when you're trying to muck about on the engine, that's for sure. Question 12. What about a second alternator? My boat only has the one rather weedy 65 amp alternator, which you may recall a video where I changed that myself with a lot of swearing and banging at it with a hammer. If you don't recall that particular joy, I'll leave a link to it in the video description below. And the question is, why not have a second alternator that is specifically for charging the batteries with the main engine alternator just used for charging the engine start battery? That is the case on most modern boats. Mine is simply quite an old boat. It was built in 2000. It's in a very traditional narrowboaty style. The more modern ones tend to have a second high power alternator, 170 amp, 180 amp, something like that, which is purely for charging up the big battery arrays that modern boats tend to have. I don't believe, although I haven't extensively looked at this, I don't think there is scope to add a second alternator onto mine. And I've never found it enough of a problem to warrant it because in summer the solar does such a good job charging the batteries, there's, there's no worry about having a second alternator. And if I'm cruising, I'll cruise for three hours, four hours maybe, and that's enough to recharge the batteries as well. So it's not really been a big issue for me needing a second alternator. I'm not sure even if I bought a modern boat that I'd need that second alternator. It just means the batteries will charge up quicker and faster and more easily, I suppose, 
if you have a big battery array while you're on the move, but it's not been a particular problem for me. Engine capacity is question 13. Based on my experience, am I happy with my engine size or would I recommend a large one, not so much for more speed, but to drive all the additional requirements? I don't think this boat needs a bigger engine. It's a 36 horsepower, normally chugging along the canals. It's going at about 1300, 1400 RPM, goes through a two to one reduction in the gearbox. So the prop is spinning presumably at about 600 RPM, 700 RPM. It's got plenty of power. The times I've been on the rivers, admittedly the rivers haven't really been flowing at all, but there's been no lack of power. And 36 is, is relatively decently sized for this size of narrowboat. I know you do find ones with Beta 43s in them, but if you're putting that level of engine in the narrowboat, you really are looking to do some serious river cruising, I think. You don't need it for the canals. You need very little horsepower to actually chug along the typical canal. Remember, there is virtually no flow on a canal, unless you're going along the Langothlan, which is a bit weird because it is used as a path for the water to go from a reservoir to somewhere else and therefore there is a flow but most canals don't really have a flow the water only moves when the locks are open and closed so it's largely static so you need very little power bear in mind you can pull a narrow boat yourself it's not hard the boat weighs about 15 tons but you pick up the center line and once you've got it moving it's very easy to pull a boat and that's one person power so 36 horsepower is absolutely plenty. I wouldn't feel the need to specify anything bigger if I bought another boat with a brand new engine in it. There's a question here about would I agree that a drawer installed under the stove to store a bag of coal would assist with stoking the fire and catching ash when cleaning it in the morning? I do actually have a little drawer under my stove. It's not big enough for coal, it's big enough for, I don't have it here, the little metal tray that you put the ash into before you go and dispose of it. That just sits in there over the summer as a little storage. I, I don't really think I'd need a whacking great drawer. There's a, an image here being depicted of a huge under fire drawer that you could put coal or ash in. I, I don't particularly feel the need for one of those. You'd just take the ash pan out the bottom of the um, stove every morning, put it into the metal tray and take it out. What I do have a problem with is the simple amount of dust this stove produces. It is phenomenal. It doesn't matter how quick I try to get the ash out of the stove and put it in the ash pan and put the lid on. Dust everywhere. It, it, I think most boaters who've got a multi-fuel stove will agree with this. The amount of dust is extraordinary and for that reason alone my new boat uh, should I ever manage to find one that meets all my requirements I would like to try a diesel stove instead of one of these coal slash wood stoves the diesel stove just light it no mess no fuss still sits in the corner looking like a stove all right not quite as traditional as one of these but I would definitely like to try a diesel stove. I think the only downside being that diesel is getting quite expensive these days, but pros and cons. The reduction in vacuuming and mess, I think would make it worth it. An interesting point here for question 15. What about an extended steel roof over the well deck? So instead of, as most boats have, the, the front bow doors and the front of the boat, and then you've got the flat well deck with perhaps a wooden cratch board over it and the canvas cover. How about instead extending the metal work of the boat out to the beginnings of the, the pointy bit right at the front? <laughs> Nautical terms. I like this idea. I would definitely, if I were in a position to have a boat commissioned, I would have the metal go all the way out and form the roof of the well deck as metal work and then you could just have canvas sides dropping down the sides. I'm not a big fan of the pointy cratch cover, I know I've got one, but I think you would get much more a sense of a room if the metal work went out the full width and, and just came in at the end, is this making any sense, with just some sides folding down rather than the the, the 
fabricy thing at a triangle as it is at the moment. So yes, I would like to have that kind of arrangement. I think it would make the well deck much more of a room. And particularly with my wish to have a reverse layout, but where the bedroom is where I'm sitting now at the front and the well deck, instead of being what is currently my storage area for coal and muck and also the entry point for the boat, in a reverse layout the way I want it, the well deck would become almost a private patio balcony to the bedroom so people wouldn't step on and off there, they wouldn't be walking through your bedroom, it would become just a little sitting out area with a little table in it for morning breakfast, coffee, croissant, oh, it would be glorious I think. And so to make that more of a room, to have the metalwork extend out and give it a proper roof, yeah I think that would be, that would be nice, I definitely like that. I'm just going to check how many questions there are here. Oh, this is the last one, question 16. And also, as I film this, there's a boat easing past. We might be in for a thump in a minute if they don't do this properly. It's a very narrow, tight corner I'm on at the moment. And they need to take care. You may also hear the engine. Anyway, um, final question then, point 16, about a dog box. Do I think the advantages of extra light and ventilation in the summer outweighs the pain of condensation in winter if I had a dog box on the roof? Sorry, really distracted by this boat coming past. Oh, that's cutting it fine. I've turned into a terrible... Um, what a curtain twitcher, that's the phrase. You know, someone who sits inside and then they hear something going on outside and they're oh, straight up like a little meerkat. Up I go. What's going on? What's going on? I have to see. I have to know. It's awful. Awful. What have I become? Anyway, um, dog boxes, Houdini hatches, all those things in the roof. I, uh, yeah, I, I like some Houdini hatches, which are the big square windows. You see them more in motorhomes, RVs than you do on boats. Boats tend to have fairly miserable little things in the in the ceiling. I would like, um, possibly in the galley, yeah, some sort of, possibly even in the saloon, some glazed, openable, shuttable Houdini hatches with fly screens that I can, so I can open the window and shut the fly screen in summer, and Yes, they might give you more condensation in winter, but already, because this boat is single glazed, the amount of condensation that forms on these windows is immense. My morning ritual, when I get up, after a wee, is go around all the windows and mop up the condensation that has formed. There's not a lot you can do about it. Um, it's just how the boats are. So, if my magic theoretical new boat had double glazed windows, but single glazed Houdini hatches, yes, I'm sure a lot of condensation would form there. You'd have to go around mopping it up, otherwise you do see a lot of boats with hatches where the woodwork all around them is just rotten and horrible and the varnish has come off and it looks terrible. So I'd like one, but you definitely need to pay attention to it. Get a double glazed one if you can, or cover it overnight so that the condensation can't form on the glass. That's the end of those questions, and it's answered, I think, many points about what I like and don't like about this boat. So, to summarise, I am looking for another boat. Idly, there's a whole logistical issue of, well, I'd have to sell this one first to have the money to go and buy another one. It's not easy, and then where would I live while I'm looking for the next boat? If the next boat doesn't come along, I could be homeless for ages. Living in the camper van? Hmm, possibly. It's a very small camper van. Anyway, whole other issue. Stuff, stuff to work on. But what I'm looking for is a semi-trad stern, 57 foot, reverse layout with an N-shaped kitchen at the back. I'll never find one like that. I'll have to get that custom made one day when I win the lottery. Um, but an N-shaped kitchen, Pullman dinette, possibly, L-shaped, possibly, saloon, then stove right in the middle of the boat, middle of the, of the saloon, middle of the boat, so it distributes the heat. Ideally a diesel stove, 
then an off-corridor bathroom with doors that can open out to the corridor to make it wider, bedroom at the front, little well deck for sitting out in, so a well deck that's designed for sitting in rather than storing stuff in, and gas lockers at the back. You remember me doing my gas locker and de-rusting it because the the gas vent holes let the canal water in so it goes all rusty. On a semi trade you often have the gas lockers at the back and that would prevent that whole issue arising. So many thoughts, so much stuff. If I actually do sell this, I'll let you know. And if I go out looking for another boat, I will let you know. And what a series of vlogs that would make. Imagine if I had a whole other boat that would just be loads of stuff to talk about. I have, however, now been talking for a very long time. No doubt the tea is cold and the Jaffa cakes are eaten. So I will say thank you very much for watching. Any questions, as always, drop them down below. I will do my best to answer. Cheerio.